Hello, Reddit. My name is Arlea, 33 years old. Lea, for short. After an incident at work, I have been ordered to go through a mandatory minimum of eight sessions of therapy. As part of my recovery, I have been advised to talk openly about a traumatic experience. However, as they did not specify whom to talk about it with, I figured I could use a public forum. I may be skirting the intentions a bit, but this was doomed to fail from the start. So let's talk about it. The summer when I did not have a face. Just looking at that sentence seems ridiculous. It was one of those events that were so far disconnected from every other part of my life that, looking back at it, does not seem real. Like something that happened to someone else. And I have just been retelling the story to myself over and over. But it was as real as it gets. And to this day, I am not sure what to make of it. Now, want to be clear, they call this a delusion. I have gone through countless personality tests and trauma care, and they have given this many names, delusion being the most common. But I refuse to let myself be gaslit. This was real, and no one can tell me otherwise. I can admit my wrongdoings in every aspect of my life but this. Back in the summer of 2001, I was 11 years old. I'd been playing with my friend Imani over at her place all day, and we kind of forgot the time. I was supposed to come straight home after having dinner at her place, but we got stuck watching The Emperor's New Groove. So, when the movie was over, I realized I was in big trouble. Mom was always a bit overprotective, as her only daughter and proclaimed miracle baby. I had a lot of expectations riding on me. It was already dark outside, but the fastest way to get home was the path next to Frog Lake. I was not allowed to go there because the streetlights were broken. They would be mad either way. So, whatever. If I had to go through the park at night, for whatever reason, I was to go straight through, no matter what. That was my plan, at least. I was about halfway through the park, panting like a racehorse. One of my braids had come loose and kept poking my nose, making me stop to sneeze every two hundred feet or so. I tried my best to keep running all the way through, but it got so dark I almost walked off the road. I had to slow down to catch my breath and navigate. You did not want to get lost near Frog Lake, or you would drown. That, or the frogmen would drag you into the lake and force you to drink tadpoles. That is what the adults kept telling us, at least. I stopped at a branch in the road to consider the fastest way home when I heard someone crying. Not a big cry, but a soft little one. A sniffling, like from a kid even smaller than I was. I knew I should have kept running, like Mom told me to, but it just made me too sad. I had to check if they were okay. I caught my breath and looked around, only to see someone on a park bench down the path to my left. They were underneath the only working streetlight, so I got a good look at them. She was a girl my age, with these little bantu knots and a bright blue summer dress. She was curled up on the bench, burying her face in her knees. And while my mom always taught me to be obedient, she also taught me to follow my heart. So I did. I sat down on the bench next to her. She kept sniffling and weeping, but it was so faint, like she had done it all day. I scooched a bit closer. Hi, I said. I am Leah. She did not answer. She just turned her back on me. Are you okay? I asked. Why are you crying? Everyone, everyone is bad, she said. They are bad, and I hate them. Why, what did they do? They put this, this stupid bracelet on, and I can't get it off, she sniffled. They said it is an ugly girl's bracelet. She held her arm out, and it was this strange copper-like bracelet with little squares linked with iron rings. There were these white silhouettes of people etched into every other square, with splotches of an iron-red color in between. 
I had never seen anything like it, and the sides looked really sharp, like sharp enough to cut yourself with. It did not look safe. Let me see, I said, taking her hand and scooching even closer. There was no immediate way to take it off, but one of the rings was a bit damaged. I inched it closer to my mouth, gnawed on it a bit, and managed to make a dent. With that, I pulled it apart. I did get a small cut on my lip, though. The sides were really sharp. As the bracelet came off, the sniffles stopped. The girl turned to me. Thanks, Leah, she said. I have waited all day for someone to help me. And as she turned around, she smiled at me. Her eyes were not red from crying. Her nose was not wet with snot. She looked perfectly normal. And she had my face. I just looked at her for a moment. She waved at me, now bracelet-free, and skipped away into the night, giggling with excitement. The bracelet still in my hand crumbled into rust. The light above, the only working light on the street, flickered. Something about it just felt wrong, and I got back on my feet. I ran home as fast as I could. When I got home, my dad was waiting by the door. I shut the door behind me, kicked off my shoes, and ran headfirst into him, crying my eyes out. I had not even noticed that I had this shiver. Maybe it was just adrenaline running off. I hugged his sweater and cried. After a few seconds, I noticed he was not moving. No pats on the back, no comforting words, no cute nicknames or kisses on the cheek. I stepped back and looked up at him. He was holding his hands out like he was ready to defend himself. His eyes had gone wide and his mouth hung open like a fish out of water. He had never looked at me like that before. Never. Dad? He fell backwards and knocked over a lamp. He crawled away from me, desperate to put distance between us. Ja! Jada! He called out. Jada! I could not stop crying. I was scared and I did not understand. He looked at me like I was a wild animal, when all I wanted was my dad. He hurried into the backyard, calling out to my mother over and over. He had this high-pitched note that I had not heard before, like he had been hurt. I just sat down on the floor, buried my face between my knees and cried. My tears felt strange on the skin of my knees. I sat there for a couple of minutes until I heard a door open did not look up. I was scared to see my dad like that again. Leah, sweetie, was my mom. Honey, are you there? I got back on my feet. It was my mom on the other side of the room. She had blindfolded herself with a towel from the bathroom. I am here, mom. Leah, honey, can you come here? I walked up to her, but when I was about six feet away, she held up a hand, urging me to stop. Slowly, honey, she said. Come here. She held out her hands. Looking back at it, I think she wanted to be sure I did not try to take off her blindfold. We held hands, and she tried her best to smile. Did you go by the lake? She asked. I need you to be honest with me. I did not want to be late. You would be mad. So you went by the lake, right? I took a deep breath and slumped my shoulders. My mom held my hands in a tight grip. Yeah, I admitted. I am sorry. My mom swallowed. I could hear her struggling to keep her breath steady. She was right there, on the edge of panic. We are going to fix this, honey, she said. We gotta, we are going to fix this. She made her way back to the kitchen and pulled out a paper bag. She told me we were playing a game and that I would get a prize if I kept the bag on. Was allowed to make holes for the eyes if I kept sunglasses on underneath. But I could not take it off. If I did, I had to warn them first. All the while, I could see my dad in the backyard, retching his guts up. You gotta keep the bag on, honey, Mom said. You gotta promise. I promised. That night, my dad could barely look at me. All he could give me were quick glances, and I could tell it was painful to him. 
He wanted to hug me, to care for me. But he was too scared. I had never seen my dad scared of anything, and having him scared of me was heartbreaking. I could see the conflict in him. At least now he was back to calling me his little Leah. It was a start. My mom made me a sandwich and chocolate milk, but I had to eat it in my room. As soon as I was done, I had to put the bag back on. That first night I sat by the edge of my bed and ate my sandwich in silence. The crust was cut off, like always. My mum was waiting just outside the door, but she could not come in as long as my paper bag was off. I did not understand. How could I? Mom, I said, what is happening? Something bad happened, honey, she said. But we are going to fix it. We are going to be okay. I feel okay, Mom. I know you do, honey. You are. You are doing great. Just have to be patient. Can Imani come over tomorrow? I am sorry, no. She cannot come over until you are better. But we were going to listen to CDs. I am sorry, honey. When I finished and put my bag back on, my mom came to my room and left a glass of water, toothpaste and a toothbrush. I could not brush my teeth in the bathroom for some reason. Bag off. Brushing. Bag on again. Mum said goodnight through the door. I could hear her sobbing as she went back downstairs. I could not sleep that night. I twisted and turned for hours on end, but my pulse just would not go down. Finally, I decided to use the bathroom, stretch my legs for a bit. Only then did I realize they had blocked my door. Standing there, turning the knob over and over, I realized I was stuck. I could hear my parents arguing downstairs through the door, snippets of a longer, angrier conversation. I'm going to call them, Dad said. First thing in the morning we are calling them. You think they will help us? You think they will just do that, out, out of the goodness of their hearts? What are we going to do then? Have you forgotten what it cost us last time? What are we going to do then? Have you forgotten what we paid? I have not forgotten a goddamn thing, but what are we going to do then? We are dealing with this. You and me. We are dealing with this. There was a quiet that hung in the air. Something that Mom had said sounded bad. Like dealing with this was a bad thing. We are going to need a gun. I woke up early the next morning, still leaning against the door. When my mum finally let me out, she had a few rules for me to follow until everything got sorted out. I was to stay inside. Above everything, I could not go outside. This was for my own protection, apparently. Secondly, I was to not look at my own reflection. Not through puddles, a reflection in the windows, the bathroom mirror, anything. No looking at myself. Third, I could not touch my own face without gloves. The gloves I was given turned out to be oven mitts. And finally, if I ever took off the paper bag or whatever they chose to conceal me with, I had to tell them about it in advance. That first day was the worst. I kept getting this awful claustrophobic feeling like I was stuck in that damn bag. I had trouble breathing and I felt trapped. Once I took it off without warning my mom but she managed to shield her eyes before it was too late. When I put the bag back on, I could tell she was furious. For a moment, I thought she was going to hit me. She had never looked at me like that before. Please, you, you cannot just take it off, she said. Never do that. Never again. Dad just was not around. He was out all day and only came back to fetch something from the garage. He and Mom talked for a bit on the driveway, then he was off again. He looked like he had been crying. All the while, I was walking around with my face concealed and oven mitts covering my hands. Mom had taken down all mirrors, and Dad had covered the windows with brown packing tape. While I was not allowed to go anywhere, my Mom still tried her best to keep me calm. She made me popcorn and allowed me to talk to Imani on the phone as long as I did not say anything about being sick. 
We did not talk for long. I ended up listening to my new Destiny's Child CD on my own. That memory of sitting on the floor of my childhood room, wearing that bag and a pair of oven mitts, is burned into my mind. While Mum was busy, I remembered my jewellery box. It had mostly plastic rings and clip-on earrings, but it had a built-in mirror on the inside of the lid. If I wanted to, I could see what the fuss was about. I dug it out and called out to Mum that I was taking off the bag in my room for a while. That way I would at least get a warning knock before she entered. So I sat there, box in hand. I took off my oven mitts and opened it. As soon as the lock clicked, I got this chill up my spine. Like dipping your toes in cold water, knowing you're about to wade out into the deep. I knew what I was doing was wrong, but it was not just wrong because Mom said so, but because I was doing something I should not be able to do. It was breaking more than just rules. Still, I opened the box. Slowly. As soon as I saw the edge of my reflection, I heard something. A laugh in the distance like a looming thunderstorm. A bright, joyous shriek. I slammed the box shut, and the laugh was reduced to a giggle. Then nothing. My hands were so warm that I could feel my fingers sweating. I could have sworn the box was hurting me. Still, I had to try again. I had to know. I clicked the lid open again and heard a plastic crackle. It was not coming from the box, but something in the room. Looking around, I did not see anything obvious. I could hear my heart beating through my chest. Then I looked up. My toys had moved. Every doll, every stuffed animal. Their heads were turned towards me. I closed my eyes, trying to convince myself I was imagining it. I opened the lid just a little and heard another crack. And again, the distant laugh. But now it was more like a hysterical cackle, almost mechanical, repeating in the same pattern, louder and louder. I saw my own throat. My skin looked ashen and dry. I could see my discoloured veins. Every set of eyes on every poster turned towards me. And it was only now that I noticed that everything looked different. Every toy, every picture, anything with a pair of eyes, the entire room was staring at me intently. Their eyes had changed colour. They looked like mine. I kept opening the box slowly. Something in me wanted to close it, to throw it away. There was a banging noise like distant thunder and that ever-growing laugh. I saw my chin, withered skin breaking into something pale. I held my hand up, about to touch my own face, to feel it out. I know I should not. I know there were rules. But on the edge of the reflection I saw my hand come closer. And as I touched my chin with the edge of my index finger, I swear, I felt bone. Then my reflection moved. My mom burst through the door. She had been trying to get my attention by banging on the door, but it was as if I had been hypnotized. She came in with her eyes closed, wielding a hammer from Dad's toolbox. Put it down, she screamed. Put it down now. I put down the jewelry box. Seconds later, she fell to her knees and smashed it to pieces. She kept hitting it, over and over, until her arm grew weak. When she could not hit it any more, she just dropped the hammer to the floor. She ripped a pillowcase from my bed and wrapped it around my head. When I could no longer see her, she took her blindfold off and wrapped her arms around me. She cried in a way I had never seen before, like a wailing child. These big, hulking sobs. She hugged me so tight that I had trouble breathing through the pillowcase. Leah, Leah, please, she cried. You have to listen to me. You have to listen. I am sorry, Mom. I am sorry too, honey. I am so sorry. That night made me realize that there was more to this than I understood. My mom and dad were doing this for a good reason. I decided to just hunker down and do what I was told. 
To see this as being sick, watching movies, eating snacks, and just waiting for it to be over. I did not mind anymore. We were in this together. Over the next few days, things started to turn into a new kind of normal. I spent most of my time with Mom just hanging out, watching TV, playing games on our shared computer. I was obsessed with The Sims and I got to play as much as I wanted. Mum would sit next to me, asking me about the characters and the stories I was making up. She even let me take off the oven mitts, as long as I kept the bag on. We had also made a cover using the pillowcase she had ripped up, so I had a more comfortable option. But I was often reminded that something was wrong. Dad would not come home until late at night, and I had to keep lying to Imani about why we could not hang out. Mum just gave me this apologetic look but did not say anything. We trusted one another now. It was a white lie. Everything would be okay. I lived like that for three weeks. I stopped questioning it. Stopped trying. Went through the motions and hoped it would be over. Sometimes I would sit by a gap in my taped-up window, just watching the people outside pass me by, much like the sims in my game. At times, I imagined them turning towards me, looking at me with my own eyes. Sometimes, they really did. One night when Dad came back, something was wrong. They usually talked a little, and then he went straight to bed. This time, they sat up long into the night. My mom had stopped locking me in my room, so I sneaked out to listen. They were being more quiet than usual, and I could not help myself. We gotta bring her, Dad said. She has to be there. We cannot, Mom cried. We cannot, it will... She will never be the same. You said we should handle it. This is how we handle it. But she does not have to be there. She has to be there, and she has to do it. The next day, Dad did not go anywhere. He sat with me while Mom prepared breakfast. He gave Mom a long look, sighed, and turned to me. I met his eyes from behind my sunglasses. Leah, honey, we are going on a trip tonight. Outside? Yeah, yeah, he smiled. We are going out on a trip. But I need you to be very careful and to listen really closely. Can you do that? Sure, yeah, I nodded. Where are we going? We are going to make you okay, honey. You are, Dad nodded. He kept his smile firm, but it was not genuine. He could tell. That night, Mum and Dad came into my room. I wrapped my head in a new pillowcase that did not have any holes for my eyes. I could not see and they also gave me a pair of earmuffs. I could not hear, could not see, and had trouble breathing through the fabric. Mom gave me a big hug. You can do this, she said. Stay strong, be patient, and do what you need to do. They took me to the car, put me in the back seat, and drove off. I heard them talking in the background, but the earmuffs blocked most of it. I picked up a yeah or a no every now and then. I just sat there with my arms crossed, trying my best to stay calm. Whatever was going on felt bad. Again, like we were doing something we should not. I could feel the road shift. It went from smooth asphalt to gravel, and then a bumpy dirt road. I had to steady myself against the door to keep my earmuffs on. I could hear a low, sorry, honey, from my mum. I reminded myself to do what she said. Be patient. Be strong. After what felt like an eternity, the car stopped. Still seeing nothing, the car door opened, and a hand led me outside. I would recognise mum's hand anywhere. It was all I needed to feel safe. She led me through a forest path, down a short hill, and into a clearing. Mum and Dad asked each other really quiet questions, mostly just one or two words. The only one I caught was, here. Finally, I heard my dad shout something. 
palm pushed the earmuffs closer together, blocking everything but my own heartbeat. I could feel water seeping into my sneakers. There was an argument, something loud and angry. Dad rushed past me. I felt the texture of his jacket brush against my arm. Another scream, a back and forth. Mom took off the earmuffs. She put something warm in my hands, something heavy, something metallic. You, you have to take it off, Dad said. She has to see her. It has to transfer. Mum did not respond. She just kept sobbing as she unwrapped the pillowcase. Everything was blurry while my eyes adjusted. Shades of black and withered green. Blue petals from a flower crushed under my sneaker. We were deep in the woods. I could feel a faint breeze making the hairs on my arm stand up. I felt nothing on my face, however, nothing at all. And right there, collapsed in the soggy moss, was the little girl I had met by Frog Lake. She was tied up and placed on the ground in front of me. I was holding a handgun. I did not know it at the time, but the safety was off. Honey, listen, said Mom. You have to do this. It has to be you. Do not think. Just point at it and squeeze the trigger, okay? Leah, honey, follow my lead. Dad was standing on the side, closing his eyes. His hands were bloody. The girl dropping in front of me looked like... me. But there was something off about her. I could not quite put my finger on a single thing. It was not just the hair. There were slight differences overall. Her eyes were a little further apart, her chin a bit longer. She looked like me, but it was not really me. It is not fair, the girl screamed. You made a deal. Do not listen to it, honey. Do not listen. She came to me willingly. She set me loose. You owe me. It is, it is evil. It is not human. You cannot listen, Leah. I looked at the girl who had my eyes, face. They threw me away just, just to get you, she spat. What makes you so special? Why did you get to, to be? What is she saying, Mom? I asked. What does she mean? Leah, just do what I tell you to. Be strong. There are no miracles, the girl screamed. Some prices are just higher than others. There are no miracles. You are no miracle. I could see her losing herself, the bone structure of her skull pushing against my ill-fitting face, eyes losing their color, hair withering as her scalp was laid barren, bantu knots dropping like little pine cones. She shrieked at me with a manic smile on my face. She was becoming less of a girl and more of a thing. One or none, they said, on oh, one or none. One or none. She twitched closer before my dad put his boot on her back, pushing her into the wet moss. Guess which one of us got the one, and which one got dumped in a lake with nothing but a fucking bracelet. I looked up at my mom. She met my gaze. She could not help but look at me, and she saw something she should not have. I do not know what she looked at in that moment but her eyes dilated and a scream got stuck in her throat. Her eyes crossed as she fell backwards, struggling to breathe. My dad came up behind me, pointed my head forward and aimed my arms for me. All I had to do was pull the trigger and I would save everyone. Mom, Dad, I would get my face back. Remember this, the girl thing purred. Remember this every time you look yourself in that goddamn mirror, little miracle. I squeezed the trigger, and the gun went off. For a moment, the world stood still. In the muzzle flash, I had this brief image of sitting on that park bench next to Frog Lake, holding hands with a sister I never had. A sister that was never truly born, dropped unceremoniously into the depths of the lake. A promise fulfilled to a power below. But in that eternal moment, in the white flash of the gun, we were just sitting on the bench together. 
holding hands. What happened afterwards is a bit of a blur. My mum was taken to the hospital. I did not have to wear the pillowcase anymore. My dad threw the gun in a lake. And then, we never talked about any of that ever again. Not that we got much chance to. Weeks later, my mum got diagnosed with cervical cancer. She lasted four years. My dad died of a brain aneurysm on my 17th birthday. I moved out of Tomscog, Minnesota to live with my aunt in West Virginia. I would spend my time at the computer. It started with mods for games and slowly turned into front-end programming. I got a nice job, nice benefits, and a move to Orlando to work at a proper office. I have been working there ever since, going on... What, eleven years? It feels strange putting this all to paper. I have had no one to talk to about it, and medical professionals do not really agree with the whole notion of giving their mental patient the benefit of the doubt. There was an incident at work. We had closed a deal with a large client, and my boss was doing this pep talk where we all went around the room with a mirror to psych ourselves up. We were to say an amazing thing about ourselves. When I looked at myself, I was going to say I had a great sense of humour, but my words got stuck in my mouth. Looking back at me was... me. But not really. It was me, but I had Bantu knots in my hair. And then I saw myself blink. I do not really know what happened after that. I broke the mirror and tried to stab someone with a cake knife, apparently. I was carried out by security and put on immediate medical leave. They had never had a problem with me before, and I am team lead in a group of nine people, so they are not eager to get rid of me. Now I can't stress this enough. I am fine. This has not happened before. I think if anything this had to do with my boss calling me a miracle worker, and it triggered something in me. Maybe something out there lives on, through me and maybe that something wants desperately to come back.